Um, so I was making that argument, but one of the things I said in the introduction was, I was part of the Pearl Jam camp. My best friend in high school, he was part of the Alice in Chains camp. We hung out with people who were with Smashing Pumpkins and Rage Against the Machine mm-hmm. and and Tool. And they we all had our, our group, but all of us had a copy of Nevermind. Yeah. We all had that album. Because you know it's foundational. It is. It's like the Bible. It's the gateway. It, it's the drug. It's the drug. It's the gateway that gets you into the, the rest of it. And, it, you know, last week when we were talking about 120 Minutes... It's not until Nirvana that it clicks with me that what I've been watching on 120 Minutes since 7th or 8th grade is what he's promoting. It didn't register because I just thought it was just quirky music. Yeah, but this is why he, why he's a pioneer. Yeah. Because he, he was hearing things that mm-hmm. nobody else was really hearing and he was able to tap into that. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, so I'm I'm I want to watch the video again of, of never of never uh, of uh, smells like Teen Spirit. Yeah, because it was so. Well, the video itself was a, wasn't like anything we'd ever seen. Mm. There were no videos on MTV that looked remotely like smells like Teen Spirit. Well, no, but it it's and if you look at the early Pearl Jam and Soundgarden videos, they're performance videos. But they're not like they're not in a gymnasium where you have cheerleaders with an anarchy symbol on their on their unitards. They're from performances. That's right. But here they come out. It's a pep rally gone to hell. Well, he he sets the tone. Which goes back to the Ramones. It does. And he sets the tone with that video for what videos can do. Mm-hmm. Because then you see like the like a, a good example of a video that's just bizarre. Mm-hmm is interstate love song by stp <laughs> and they're and i love them but they're just stealing <coughs> that was their that was their gift is they just they didn't borrow anything they just stole it well we like what you did there <laughs> and we like that and we're gonna put them together david spade on a uh, spade in america when they started to get big he says stone temple pilots very cool band but i liked them better the first time when they were called pearl jam <laughs> <laughs> But, anyway. but the video for Interstate Love Song mm-hmm. is so weird. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense with the lyrics. Because you don't see a single train in that video. <laughs> and it's like, but you sing about a train. <laughs> but the song is called Interstate Love Song. And you got this guy uh, who's Scott driving this old beat up hoopty <laughs> down the interstate. And, and, and it's just these strange kind of uh, non sequitur moments and all of these wonderful videos. Yeah. And Nirvana makes it possible. I don't yeah. know who directed that video. I don't know who conceptualized that video. I don't know if it was Kurt. No. Well, I don't. So the story is, so they picked the worst video director they could find because they thought it was funny. <laughs> and this guy had like the worst reel in the world. And so they pick him. And I, I don't know who came up with the idea of the high school. I'm sure if you asked Ezra, he could tell you everything about it. He's a big uh, Nirvana fan. Here, so so this is, okay, going into adulthood, this is where Gen X actually is awesome. I went and bought um, a little black Civic, right? And when we when Sarah and I originally bought our, our uh, Chevy S10 Blazer, when we went to pick it up, Lucas rode back with me in the S10 Blazer. So when I picked your kid, it, yeah. So when I bought the Civic, Ezra rode with me to go to get the car and, and bring it back. And he's like three, right? Now he has always had an ear for loud, obnoxious rock and roll, right, all the way down. But I remember that's the day when it clicked with me that smells like Teen Spirit was something special to that little boy because I played it in the new car that we just picked up and he's got this big grin and he's trying to sing along and he doesn't know the words but he's like so I hit repeat and he went through it again and he has loved absolutely loved that song ever since and Nirvana as a a whole as a whole yep 
yeah when he first started playing guitar all he knew were nirvana songs and i had to sit him down a couple of times and tell him you've got to learn something else besides nirvana <laughs> because that's all he was learning that's all he was teaching himself was nirvana songs wow. <laughs> like, dude you gotta reach out so now he's expanded he he's uh, learning all kinds of different stuff and he's also discovered jerry cantrell he loves jerry cantrell from alice in chains one of my one of my son's best friends if not his best friend uh, i was talking about grunge with him and my son mm -hmm. and he doesn't like grunge he likes prog rock right and i'm like what what's wrong with grunge he's like it's and and i never thought about it this way before but uh -huh. he's not wrong he said it's far too suicidal <laughs> 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 And when you go into when you go into that four years and listen to the music, mm -hmm. he's not wrong. Yeah, man <laughs> in the box. <laughs> well, man in the box is about Jerry Cantrell's dad mm -hmm. being a POW in Vietnam. It is, and it's dark. Yeah, and you don't feel good, and you got to keep all the sharp objects away from you when you listen to it. <laughs> Well, what Pearl Jam had black. They did. Sheets of empty canvas. Um, uh, Nirvana had every life. single song they sang. <laughs> uh, that's not true. About a girl. <laughs> that's very, the only happy song. Well, I and think Polly. They have. Polly has a great outcome. That's true. Because, and I mentioned this on uh, <laughs> the one that came out yesterday <laughs> about how she feigned Stockholm syndrome to get out from under this guy. With, and it worked with with Kurt though I think he's writing from a very dark place almost the entire time he's I, writing this writing this music are. they all are I mean Eddie reads a article about a kid shooting himself in front of his and then writes and then Jeremy, writes Jeremy. and know? then you already you already mentioned man in the box yeah man in the box and then um let's see what else uh hey man nice shot oh Mighty K Four Squirrels wrote a wonderful song called Mighty KC and it's all about finding out that Kurt has died. Yep. Yeah, it's very dark. Pumpkins, um, um everything. Everything. <laughs> but my my first, despite all my rage. Yeah. I'm still just a rat in a cage. <laughs> Which is which is great because the song is about how futile your anger is. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's the only emotion you can really experience anymore. Yeah. But it doesn't do anything. When I was um when I had my own place up in pilot um, in between high school and college during that that wonderful three years um, there was one night some girls were coming over to hang out and I'm when they got there I was playing mayonnaise from uh, from uh, Siamese dream and I was so happy because I'd been trying to figure this song out for the past couple of days and I finally figured it out and I'm playing along playing along and I'm just so excited and this one of the girls walks in and she's like, why are you playing that depressing song? And I'm like, it's not depressing. And then I got to listen. I was like, man, this is depressing. <laughs> well, disarm. Yeah. You know, the, even though the opening lyric is disarm you with a smile, he's talking about how he's never going to measure up. No. And it's just like, oh. But I think that's one of the reasons it spoke to us. Yeah. Because the music that had come before, and that that's the... That's the other with thing. With the exception of Guns N' Roses. With the exception of Guns N' Roses, the music that came before it was extraordinarily frivolous. And maybe Skid Row, because if you listen to Skid Row, well, like Skid Row, 18, 18 and Life, and Life is yeah. dark. Yeah. It's dark, and it, but, but the music of the time was so frivolous, mm -hmm. whereas the lyrics of the, the 90s and with, with rock or grunge or alternative or whatever the hell you want to call it. <laughs> rock. Is, it's just rock. Is so, you know? It's so substantial, and there's... And there's so much going on, and it is it is an intellectual pursuit mm -hmm. to make sense of those lyrics. Yeah, and we really wanted to understand. Yeah, we did. And and at the time, if you tried, if you asked me, and I, I was not I was in high school, but I was obviously sucked into literature. Mm -hmm. If you were to ask me to try to interpret "Smells Like Teen Spirit," I would laugh at you and say. I got nothing. Well, now I, I could. Yeah. Then. Oh yeah. Back then, no. And, and the thing is, is like we bring up. Um, I talk about uh, smells like Teen Spirit when I'm trying to explain poetry, and I give them the chorus. Just the lyrics. Just the chorus. Oh. Not even the the verses. Just one chorus, right? With the lights out, it's less dangerous. And I stop there, and I'm like, "What is he talking about? Here we are now, entertainments. What is he talking about?" I feel stupid. I feel stupid and, and contagious. contagious. 
What is he talking about? And once I get them to actually fill in the blanks, I'm like, now you're ready to read poetry. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's the exact same thing. I wonder what he was reading. He was reading. I don't ask your kid; he'll know. Well, okay, so <laughs> I know that Penny Royal T is based on a novel that he absolutely loved, but I don't know the name of that novel. And Ezra, Ezra knows the name of the novel. <laughs> Ezra's actually the one that told me about that one. <laughs> so maybe, maybe your son's love for Nirvana is a little unhealthy. Yeah. Well, he. He wants to recreate the '90s. Good luck. It was funny. Like last uh, last Halloween, he wanted to go as Eddie Vedder, <sighs> and he was like, I, "I, what do I do?" You know, Eddie Vedder from the '90s, and he was like, "I don't know." You know, got any suggestions or whatever? The and I'm best like, flannel shirt. I said, you can. "No." I looked at him and I said, "Just dress like your father." <laughs> <laughs> You have flannel shirts? I do. He's got my flannels. Okay. He's got them. And the Baja sweaters? They're long gone. I don't have any more Baja sweater, but I do have a ton of hoodies. We left. went to the beach a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, yeah. and we went into one of those beach shops and they had a whole rack of them. Did you see? Well, I remember when uh, she and I went um, to do that, where she had to go and do that wedding. We went into a little surf shop. And what I, is it with? The Baja sweaters, man. The surfers love them. My son loves them. My son loves 90s culture. Though he's coming later because he, he, he appreciates Nirvana. Yeah. And Alice in Chains. And, uh, but he, he's, he's a really big Foo Fighters fan. Mm. Yeah. Well, Ezra is by default a Foo Fighters fan because of Dave. How can you not be, though? Yeah. They're fun. Yeah. But again, they're also talking about difficult things. Well, you know, the... the one who shall not be named, who left me for another country. Um, oh, she had a mm. she had a big thing for Dave. Still smarts, don't it? <laughs> like I said, the one who shall not be named. <laughs> uh, Foo Fighters were fun, but Foo Fighters were were weird because the music and what makes them so creative is the music and the lyrics are in tension with each other. Yeah. Because There Goes My Hero sounds really positive. You're like, right. that's so uplifting. Until you listen to the lyrics, and it's like, <laughs> oh, my God. Well, and I've said, well, here's the thing. I've always said that Everlong, to me, is probably the perfect love song ever written. It is. I would agree with that. And it's not a ballad. It's not a ballad. It's just, you know, breathe out so I can breathe you in. That line alone... But I think one of the cool things about Foo Fighters is you got to see, over the course of the Foo Fighters um, journey, you got to see Dave Grohl mature as an artist. How did he become that? To go from drumming for Nirvana? He had, a, well, okay, so the way he tells it, and I've seen several different interviews where he kind of says the same thing. So this is coming from, I, I actually believe him. He had... He had already been writing stuff. When he was in Nirvana. Yeah. And if you notice, a lot of the stuff on that first record sounds like Nirvana. And it's because he Be was writing. Because he, was, he was writing stuff that he wanted to give to Kurt. And some of the stuff Kurt liked. Right? Um, but then Kurt died. And Dave said for a long time after Kurt killed himself, he didn't want to do anything with music. He had a hard time listening to the radio. And then he started playing these songs again. And then he put a demo together. And the demo is actually the first record. Wow. He's like WB Yates, man. Yeah. He, he reinvents himself. Yeah. He only does it twice. Yates did it yeah. three times. But but I think the, the Dave Grohl that we've got with the Foo Fighters. So the Dave Grohl we've got with Nirvana is that kid from D.C. who was a drummer for all these hardcore bands who lucked into what would be the greatest position for a drummer in the last 40 years since the end of the Beatles. And then after that, when it all comes crashing down, he takes a step back and reinvents himself. And the Dave Grohl that we have now, I think is the real Dave Grohl. And it's the Dave Grohl who's learned the system, learned the industry and been able to use it to grow. Yeah, as an artist, and they're refined too. Yeah, in that you would never mistake them for early '90s music. No, 
but the lyrics are so substantial. Yeah. They don't do frivolity. No. It's not in his DNA Mm-mm. to write that kind of music. Yeah. Um, but, but they sound like they've been refined, even though yeah. they're just, they're really not. So I have to, so yeah, Foo Fire, done. So I have to talk about Next. Pearl Jam. Of course you do. Because that's my guy. I'll just sit back. Can I turn my mic off? <laughs> <laughs> well, no. And we talked about, you know, like that moment, uh, the first time I heard t- Smells Like TJ. And it is a weird feeling because you hear it and you're like, what is that? And it is shocking. It is processing. And then you want to hear it again. And it, I think it's the second or third time that you hear something like that, that you really start to appreciate. Well, this is huge. This is amazing. This is unlike anything I've ever heard. Because I think the initial hearing, you're not thinking, this is the the most incredible thing I've ever heard. And when I talk to people, and I talk, I actually give a talk about this, and you know, because you've come to it. It's I can pinpoint that's the moment my life changed. But at that moment, I didn't know my life was changing. I didn't realize that shift was happening. It's only in hindsight you can look back and say, there's the moment. And it's the moment in that field house when I hear it for the first time and it stops me dead in my tracks. Not because it's the most incredible thing I've ever heard before. It is because this doesn't sound right with what I'm seeing. It goes against everything I understand in the world. What is this? So with Pearl Jam, that was a different experience from Nirvana. Because with Nirvana, you're shocked. By the time I get into Pearl Jam, what happened was the first thing I ever heard was Even Flow. And, uh, well, let me back up. I had seen Oceans and I'd seen a lot. I didn't like them. I didn't get it, right? I didn't, it wasn't like, and it was kind of like the same thing with Alice in Chains. First couple of Alice in Chains songs, I didn't get it. It was like, oh, okay. You're angry and you've got a raw speed voice. Right, <laughs> but then I heard Even Flow, and I thought this is actually kind of cool, and it had a really good swing to it. You know, it had some great tempo. What hooked me was Jeremy, and the reason why Jeremy hooked me, and I've been all Pearl Jam ever since. Eddie is is the guy, right? Like if Eddie Vedder walked in right now, I would still revert back to being 15 years old and faint. <laughs> but the thing that got me with Jeremy is the the crescendo, the building and the building and the building. And throughout that entire song, even today when I listen to that song, it amazes me how they're able to pack so much tension into that song to where you when you get to the end. When he shoots himself. Yeah, when you get to the end, yep. it releases, and it's one of the biggest releases in music. It just ha- and it's just unbelievable. Oh, it's smart. It's it smart. is. It's art music. It's incredible songwriting. And if you listen to, I don't know how they came up with this. If you listen to the riff versus the vocal melody that he puts on top of it, they don't match. No, they don't. But they work. Yes. It's unreal. And that's what hooked me with with Pearl Jam. I was like, this is something special. And I have been a diehard. And then I went back and real and started to understand the beauty of Alive. And the uh, and I've made like one of my life uh, my life sayings, I guess, is the opening line to Oceans: "Hold on to the thread; the currents will shift." So, but Jeremy was your entree into that. That was yeah. the well. Even flow started to catch my attention, and I thought, well, maybe this band is pretty good. And then Jeremy came out. I was like, whoa! Because at that point, I was going through my REM phase. 